Welcome to a supplemental video update. These are videos that I like to do from time to time where I go beyond what I usually post in the daily and weekly videos to take a topic and look at it more in depth. Well, over the weekend, I was watching a video put out by Shivako Capital and also a fellow listener pointed this out to me that the video was quite good and had some insight so I decided to go through that video kind of turn it into my own video and see if this can give us some insight as to what's happening in the market I felt kind of uncomfortable after I finished the daily video for Monday I don't like coming to a mixed conclusion doesn't necessarily mean that I've changed from that right now, but at least we have more things that we can look at to try to evaluate things on a day in and day out basis. First things to take note of, the basis for this video did originate from another YouTube video posted by Shivako Capital. You can look for that video. It was posted after the close on May 5th. There's a video link that I'll have right here. Also, there'll be a video link in the description below. Here is the actual link. The video presented here is my own attempt to take the insight that I gained from the Shivako Capital video and then present it in my own way. And for a more complete explanation, I would encourage all of you to watch both videos. So if you're watching this one first, after you finish, please feel free to check that link in the description to take you to the other video. He goes into some additional areas that I don't go into, like gold. He looks a little bit more at international stocks and things like that, where my focus right now is the S&P 500. To provide visual references, the following charts, they're pretty much carbon copies of each other. They plot a simple moving average rainbow, so it's going to look all nice and colorful ranging from 20 periods at the very beginning all the way up to 250 periods. So why study bond yields and maturities? Didn't I say that I focus on the S&P 500? That's the name of the program, the SPX Investing Program. Well, we look at other markets to try to gain some insight as to what's happening within the S&P. So the focus of the SPX Investing Program is on the S&P 500 itself. However, the S&P 500 does not exist in a vacuum. There are forces in other markets that can influence price action that can either be positive or negative. So we want to look at a broad range of things in order to get more insight to help us make better decisions. So one market that has a great impact on the S&P 500 is the bond market. Bonds are studied by analyzing two main factors. We look at the direction of interest rates, whether they're going up or down. And then the maturity of the bonds. There's 30-day bonds, there's 90-day bonds, there's 30-year bonds, and everywhere in between. And whether these bonds are being purchased, meaning the price is going up, or sold, meaning that the price is going down. We look at one- to three-year bonds. These are considered to be short-term bonds. And we also look at four- to ten years. These are medium, or we can also call them intermediate-term bonds. And then anything over 10 years is considered a long-term bond, just to give you a few definitions. Bond studies are a part of a thing called intermarket analysis, which I do a video on that every week. I also acronym it as IMA. Looking at bond yields and maturities, when interest rates are rising, which is kind of the environment that we've been in, it's preferred to own shorter-term bonds. And if you think about that, that makes sense. Why lock in a rate for a longer bond when you can just roll a shorter term bond and then keep rolling it as interest rates continue to go up you're getting a higher and higher interest rate at least that's the theory so a bond investor does not want to lock in an interest rate for a longer period since they would not be able to take advantage of rising rates if rates are going up and you've already locked in a 10-year or a 30-year bond you're not going to be able to take advantage of that rise in interest rates so the method used is to own shorter term bonds when interest rates are going up, then you can roll into the next maturity into another shorter term bond with a higher yield. Conversely, when interest rates are falling, it's preferred to own longer term bonds. Think about that. If you have a 10 year or a 30 year bond, you've locked in a higher rate and rates are going down, you're doing much better at that point. A bond investor wants to lock in a higher interest rate for a longer period. This method is used when you own longer term bonds, which can be held longer. You maintain that higher yield as interest rates continue to decline. 
All right, here's the first chart that we look at. This is comparing the one to three year treasury bond against the three to seven year treasury bond. And by looking at this chart, we go back to the beginning of 2022, where we see the uptrend suggested that the Fed was raising rates, and that's exactly what was happening. So the shorter term maturity was going up faster than the longer term maturity. Bond investors want to own shorter term bonds as interest rates rise, and interest rates were doing that. That's why this ratio was going up. The one to three year bonds were outperforming the longer term three to seven year bonds. Well, then we got to the beginning of 2023 and things started to shift. The shift in the ratio suggests that the bond market thinks that the Fed is close to finishing raising rates. Now, they could be wrong, but we're seeing this in the price charts, this anticipation that's going on, or that at least they're getting ready to pause raising interest rates. The ratio is starting to fall, as we see here in the chart, below the rainbow, and shorter-term moving averages are also declining. So this is suggesting that the shorter-term bonds aren't as favorable right now as going further out to three to seven years. But we need more evidence than this just to say, oh, the Fed is done, they're going to pause, they're going to start cutting rates. You can get all kinds of opinions on the media and reading blogs and watching videos. Everybody has a stance. I like to look at the charts and then have that evidence presented to me, and then I can make a decision based on that. In the previous chart, which compares the one to three year maturity with the three to seven year maturity, looks potentially bullish for stocks since the ratio is going down, and it might be seen as conclusive. We could just look at this chart and go, yeah, interest rates are starting to go down. We can jump back into the stock market and it's clear sailing going forward. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. It's common for one chart to be used for making decisions, and this is a big part of my philosophy. Some people don't really like my analysis of the markets because I use every indicator I can find. I look at all kinds of charts, and I make videos every day. I like that because I'm taking all this information together, assimilating it, and then reaching a conclusion. In fact, I call it the consensus method is the approach that I take. Yes, there can be analysis paralysis where you're looking at all kinds of things and there's usually positive and negative things all at the same time. But over the years, I've developed a system where I'm trying to get into that consensus of do we look positive, do we look negative, or do we look sideways? However, it's best to evaluate all of the available relevant information sources to see if we can draw that same conclusion. We just saw a chart that looked like interest rates were starting to come down. Can we find other charts that also suggest that? Then we take everything together and we get better insight as to where we're at with things and then that helps us to make better decisions. The first extra evidence that we look at is to look at maturities that are further out to see if they are telling the same story. Remember in that first chart, we looked at the one to three year compared to the three to seven year. Now we're going to look further down the chain and see if we're seeing the same kinds of things. The next chart compares the seven to 10 year bond with the three to seven year bond. Now this one looks a little bit different. The idea that if the Fed is finished raising rates, this chart should be going up. As of the close on May 5th, 2023, this suggests that the markets are not completely confident that the Fed is finished. We would see this really going up when we hit the low back in October. We have been showing some improvement here, but we're not breaking out above any of these moving averages yet. So that suggests that there's not a lot of confidence when you go further out with maturity and interest rates. Now we look at even longer term maturities. The previous chart, which we just saw, compares the seven to 10 year maturity with the three to seven year maturity, it's showing a lot of improvement, but it's not breaking out to the upside. If interest rates in the longer term were starting to come down, we would have seen that chart showing a lot of improvement going up. And it's going up and it is improving, but it's not breaking out. If the bond market participants were more confident that the Fed is ready to stop or maybe even pause rate hikes, this ratio would look even better, meaning it would go up more than we saw on that chart. The conclusion that we can draw from that is that bond investors are willing to go out from the one to three month year maturity to the three to seven year maturity, but they're not yet willing to go further to the seven to 10 year maturity. 
So the shorter term interest rates, they're looking a little more under control. Further out, it's not looking as positive, at least yet. But what about credit risk? Now with bonds, they are different than stocks. When you buy a stock, you're buying ownership in a company. When you buy a bond, you're loaning money to a government or to a company or to an entity, and they're going to pay you interest for loaning them the money. And then when that bond matures, you not only get the interest from loaning them that money, you also get your money back at that point. What if a company can't pay? What if they can't make their interest payments? This is known as credit risk. So credit risk is the level of fear that the issuer of the bond, whether it's a city, a state, a corporation, are they able to pay the stated interest rate that they told you they would pay as well as being able to repay the value of that bond when it matures, whether it's a one-year bond, a 10-year bond, or a 30-year bond. U.S. Treasury bonds are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, which essentially means they are risk-free. Now, we're going through a lot of changes economically, governmentally, and the whole world is shifting. At least for right now, U.S. government bonds are considered to be the safest investments on the planet. However, when there's little risk, there's also little reward. We all want to take no risk and get a high return. That's just human nature. But the world just doesn't work that way. To state this another way, the greater the reward, the greater the risk. A bond may be paying a very high interest rate, but the credit worthiness of the bond issuer, whether it's a government, a corporation, a municipality, that may be in question. All investors must reach a delicate balance between fear and greed. Of course, fear that, oh no, I'm going to lose some money. I don't want that to happen. And greed, I want more, 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 more. That's the battle that we deal with every day, and that's what goes on in the markets every day. Assessing this different credit risk. One way to measure credit risk is by looking at junk bonds. You might have heard of those before. Junk bonds, they pay potentially higher yields, but they're also exposed to potentially greater risk. Sometimes an entity may raise money to try to take over another company, and they do that by issuing junk bonds. Well, you don't know if that's actually going to work out or it may be a real risky endeavor. And so they're not considered to be as safe, but to make up for that, they pay a higher yield. And junk bonds are also referred to as high yield bonds. So they tend to use that interchangeably. Here's a chart. Now looking here, it says if the market was confident that the Fed was finished raising rates, this chart would be going up. What is happening right now? Yeah, it's showing some improvement, but we're right inside the rainbow currently. Now, also another point here is that the ratio was going up until the current banking crisis news hit the markets. You see this real downturn? That was in March. That's when all of the Silicon Valley bank news and Credit Suisse and all these other banking things started to happen, and that's really taken a toll on this ratio. Just to give you an idea, and think about this. As of May 4th, that's the latest that I could get data, the junk bond average yield to maturity was 8.62%. Hey, how would you like to be getting that? That's actually above inflation, where the safer bond, the three to seven year, it's paying 3.39%. Still has gone up from where it was before, but it's still below inflation. So overall, you're still losing money. If interest rates were getting ready to come down, we would see this ratio going up, and we're just not seeing that yet. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about junk bonds. The previous chart compares junk bonds, where you have higher risk, but also a higher potential reward, and it compares that with the 7 to 10 year maturity, which is lower risk and a lower reward. The ratio that we just saw is not showing an awful lot of confidence. It should be going up when actually it's just chopping sideways and even going down. If the bond market were more confident that the Fed is ready to stop or pause rate hikes, this ratio would look even better than it has. It is showing some improvement, but it's not breaking out. The conclusion that we can draw from this previous chart is that bond investors are willing to go out further from the one to three year maturity to the three to seven year maturity, but they're not yet willing to go into junk bonds with any confidence. But what about another kind of bond that's available to investors? Corporate bonds. Let's look at those. 
Here is a chart. Intermediate term corporate bond ETF compared to the three to seven year treasury bond ratio, where we had confidence after we hit the low back in 2022 and into the beginning of 2023, but then we had the banking crisis hit and this fell and we're back inside of the rainbow. So we can say there's uncertainty and a real lack of confidence right now. If the markets had economic confidence, this chart would be going up. If we're going up, that's considered to be more risk on where you're willing to get into stocks. If it's going down, that's more risk off where you're getting out of stocks and getting into bonds. Just to give you an idea, as of May 4th, the corporate bond yield to maturity was just a little bit over 5%. The three to seven year bond ETF yield to maturity is currently at 3.39%. So if you're looking for more of a yield, you would be more inclined to get into the corporate bond. They're not necessarily outperforming government bonds, which are considered to be safer. So what are some conclusions that we can make about corporate bonds? The previous chart that we just looked at, it compares corporate bonds that have higher risk and a potential higher reward than the three to seven year maturities that have lower risk, but also lower reward. Yet again, the ratio is not showing a lot of confidence right now. If the bond market were not fearful of credit risk, this ratio would look even better since intermediate term corporate bonds are currently yielding over 5% where you're getting a yield of 3.39% when you're into three to seven year maturities. And this changes every day and it's updated every time I do a video. The conclusion that we can draw from that is the previous chart is showing us that bond investors are willing to go further out from one to three year maturities to three to seven year maturities, but they're not yet willing to go into junk bonds with any confidence. Do you see a pattern that's developing here? But then we ask the next question, what about inflation? Is it going to go back up? Is it going to go down? Is it going to stay about the same? That is the CPI. And in fact, this coming week on Wednesday, we will be getting another CPI report to gauge where we're at with inflation. As long as inflation continues to fall, the scenario presented in this video is worth watching to see if there are additional improvements going forward. We're not at a decision point right now at the time I make this video. My desire in making this video was to point these things out to you. I will update them every day, and then I'll point them out in the daily videos that I post. However, if inflation starts to go back up, this will necessitate that we fall back and regroup to uncover additional evidence, gain insight, and reach new conclusions. We can only go with the information that we have with us right now. This chart that you see here is called the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. And think back to the COVID lockdowns. You probably heard in the news a lot of supply chain, supply chain issues. That's when this line was really going up as inflation was going up. This has also shifted forward by about six months after it's been smoothed to make these line up. But both of these have been coming down. If this continues, okay, the scenario that we're looking at right now looks more viable. If inflation starts to turn and go back up, now we have to fall back and say, uh-oh, things have changed now. We need to reevaluate where we're at and where it looks like we're going headed forward. What about looking at some other stock indexes? Okay, other indexes such as the QQQs, which is the ETF for the NASDAQ 100, we can evaluate those to see if the situation is improving, staying the same, or getting worse. We can gain some insight from this by looking at the chart that I'll show you in just a moment. That helps us to determine, is the market more risk on? That's usually when prices are going up. People buy stocks and that pushes prices higher. They're getting into stocks and out of bonds. Or are we headed more in a risk off direction where we're getting out of stocks and into bonds? Why do we look at the QQQ or the NASDAQ 100? The NASDAQ 100, it's comprised mainly of tech stocks and they attempt to provide growth. The idea is to buy low and sell high. If you're buying Apple or Microsoft or Google, you want to buy at one price and then at some point in the future sell it for a higher price, that is a typical growth stock. If interest rates and inflation are rising, tech stocks are hurt by this because it costs more for them to borrow money. It also bites into their earnings, and these earnings are what justify higher prices. That's why we call them growth stocks. You're not buying a stock for its earnings right now. 
The idea is to hold on to this stock so that at some point in the future, earnings are going to go through the roof, and that's going to bring the stock price up with it. Here is a chart of the QQQ compared to the three- to seven-year Treasury bond, where for all of 2020 and into 2021, we had this risk-on environment. All this liquidity was coming into the market. Interest rates were at zero, and tech stocks just seemed to go to the moon. Well, when we started 2022, all of that shifted, and now we were more in a risk-off posture. Where are we at right now? We're starting to show some improvement, and we're favoring more of the risk on when you just look at the QQQs. So as this ratio goes up, this is more positive for stocks. And a lot of the growth that we've seen in 2023 has come from the NASDAQ 100, hence the QQQ. What are some conclusions that we can make from this? Well, the first thing to talk about is the previous chart of the QQQ, which is higher risk and potentially higher reward. We compare that with a three to seven year maturity, which has lower risk and lower reward. The ratio is showing improvement. Q investors, which means tech, are more confident that the Fed is ready to stop or at least pause raising rates, so this ratio is going higher. So that puts us in the camp that maybe things are looking better. The Qs, or the NDX, are outperforming the three to seven year bonds, and they're climbing above the rainbow moving averages. The conclusion that we can draw from this is that tech investors are willing to invest in tech stocks rather than in three to seven year bonds. If investors feared earnings growth, that it was going to go down in the NASDAQ 100 stocks, they would not be buying. They would be selling. Let's look at the S&P 500. This is the backbone of what I do here. The main index used to implement strategies in the program that I have called the SPX Investing Program is the S&P 500 and the ETF that's attached to the S&P 500 called the SPY or the SPY or the SPIDERS, however you want to call that. We can evaluate the S&P 500 to see if the situation is improving, staying the same, or getting worse. The insight that we gain from this, we can look at charts we can use to determine are we getting more risk on? People are getting into stocks and out of bonds, or are we getting more risk off? They're getting out of stocks and going into bonds. Why the S&P 500? Why do we look at that more than anything else? Well, I have a whole video section where I talk about my reasons for that. But briefly, the S&P 500 is the benchmark for the U.S. stock market. I know everybody likes to talk about the Dow, but it's only 30 stocks. The S&P 500 has over 500 stocks, and that's a better representation of how the stock market is performing. And it gives the most comprehensive evaluation of current stock market conditions. The S&P 500, it has multitudes of highly liquid instruments that are attached to the SPY that can be used to implement a seemingly unending number of strategies. And that's what I teach in my program. You can make money when the market goes up. You can make money when the market goes down. You can make money when the market goes sideways. You can implement many strategies all at the same time. You can have shorter term, longer term, and anywhere in between. I'm so busy just managing all of the different strategies within the S&P 500, I don't have time to look at other stocks. If interest rates and inflation are rising, most S&P 500 stocks, they're hurt by this because it will increase their borrowing costs and it can lower their earnings, which again is used to justify higher stock prices. That's ultimately what drives stock prices. There's a lot of hype that makes stocks go up or down, but eventually it comes down to how much is a company earning? Are their profits growing? Are their revenues growing? Are their sales growing? That's ultimately what justifies stock prices going higher. Here is a chart. How does this look? Hmm. Well, from 2020 into 2021, we were looking really good. We were way above all of these different moving averages in the rainbow. And then we hit 2022, and we have been starting to chop sideways and look at where we're at right now. Now, one thing that you may be hearing about from time to time is the economy going to have what's called a soft landing, which means we see some economic slowdown and interest rates are going up, but we don't go into a recession 
or are we going to have a hard landing where we will go into a recession? Typically with this chart, when we're going up and above, that means that we're favoring more of a soft landing. And that would be better for the market and for all Americans and probably for the world. If we start to drop down below this, that indicates that we will probably have a hard landing. You can see by this chart, the market doesn't really know what it thinks right now. We're going to have to watch this played out day by day. So is this chart suggesting that there will be stagflation? That's another thing that you may have heard about from time to time, and I'll address that in just a moment. Because it's going sideways, we're seeing interest rates going up, but the market's not really going up. Do we have to really worry about that? So rather than just look at this ratio, what we need to do is take both parts of this ratio and look at them individually. First, we'll look at the SPY, which is the S&P 500, and then we'll look at the IEI, which is the three to seven year treasury bond ETF. So what are some conclusions that we can make? The previous chart that we just looked at, it compares the S&P 500, which is considered to have higher risk and higher reward, with the three to seven year maturity, which has lower risk and lower reward. The ratio is chopping sideways and lacking any real conviction right now. Investors in the S&P 500, they're not very confident that the Fed is ready to stop or pause raising rates. So this ratio is going sideways right now. The S&P 500, it's not convincingly outperforming the three to seven year bond, nor is it necessarily underperforming. It's right about in the middle right now. And why I reached more of a mixed conclusion when I made the daily video for Monday. The conclusion that we can draw from this is that the chart needs to be watched and evaluated every day until it becomes more clear if the S&P 500 is assuming more of a risk-on posture or a risk-off posture. There are some shortcomings that we need to look at when we're doing ratio analysis. I use a lot of ratios, and if you watch my videos very often, a lot of the charts have ratios comparing one part of the market with another part of the market. And these can be very helpful to determine relative performance, which one is doing better, which one is doing worse. Many ratio charts are analyzed and used in the daily videos that I put out for the SPX investing program. However, ratio evaluations may not always tell the whole story. Ratios measure the relative performance between two assets, which one is doing better, which one is doing worse. But what if both assets are going up or down at the same time, but one asset is either going up or down more or less than the other one? This can potentially be misleading when you look at the chart. So how do we overcome this? We look at each chart individually that makes up that ratio to see how they are performing. So here is the S&P all by itself. We hit the low in October of 2022. Does this look like it's improving here? My answer would be yes. It's not going gangbusters to the moon or anything, but it's sure doing better than it was. How about the three to seven year treasury bond ETF? It spent a lot of 2022 really coming down. It hit a low in October. Does this chart look to be improving? Yes. So what can we conclude by looking at this ratio then comparing the S&P to the three to seven year bond ETF? Both the S&P and the bond ETF are improving. This allows us to have confidence in this ratio, at least for right now. If necessary, we can apply additional indicators. I can do some correlation studies. We can apply more moving averages. We can apply lots of different indicators to this to gain some further insight. Right now, I'm going mostly on the rainbow chart and then just looking at what is price doing overall. What about looking at some non-US indexes? Can we get any insight from that? The following chart that I'm going to show you, it's called the Eurozone that makes up the EU market. These are European stocks, which because they're stocks, they have a higher risk and also potential higher reward. And we're going to compare that with the seven to 10 year maturity, which has a lower risk versus lower reward. The ratio is showing some confidence and I'll show you the chart here on the next slide. Eurozone stock market investors, they're more confident that at least the Fed in the U.S., like they really care about that all that much, but the U.S. is still the leader in the world. Do they think that the Fed is ready to stop or pause rate hikes? If that were true, this ratio would look even better than it is, and it is looking pretty good. However, this should not be taken with as much weight since it compares European stocks with U.S. bonds. Yes, you can mix and match the two, 
kind of an arbitrage type situation or to try to hedge yourself one way or another. But still looking at this can be helpful, but it's not what I do in my program. Here is the chart where for 2022, this ratio had really been going down. But near the latter part of 2022, going into 2023, we're seeing a real nice rebound here. Wouldn't that be nice if we saw this in the U.S.? Now, my understanding is that after the great financial crisis back in 2008 or so, European banks took the new regulations and the new rules a lot more seriously, and so their banks are doing much better than U.S. banks. Just think about the banking situation that we're in right now with Silicon Valley Bank, with First Republic Bank, and some other banks that have been in the news lately. You're not hearing about that. Okay, there's Credit Suisse. They were kind of their own little thing there. But to my knowledge, we're really not hearing any information yet anyway about other European stocks that are running into trouble. And so this ratio is having a tendency to go up. In fact, it's looking very similar to the QQQ ratio that we just showed a few minutes ago. Another thing that we have to worry about is stagflation. Stagflation is when the economy is experiencing very high inflation, little to no economic growth. Yes, we have high inflation, but to this point, it's coming down. We do have some economic growth. GDP remains positive, and our employment situation is still very positive. We just had the jobs report last Friday. We added a bunch of new jobs, and the unemployment rate actually went down. But this is something that investors worry about going forward from here. This is what we experienced back in the 70s, and this is when I grew up, and boy, do I remember this very well. If there is current stagflation fears, there's a thing called TIPS, Interest rate instruments that adjust as rates go up or down, they should be outperforming fixed rate bonds. Now think about that. If you have a bond and it adjusts as inflation goes up, isn't that kind of cool? There is such a thing that you can use and they're called tips. They should be outperforming fixed rate bonds where you buy a five or a 10 year bond and then you're stuck with that yield for the duration of that bond. Also, Interest rate sensitive stocks, sectors, and industry groups would be showing some weakness. And this can include areas such as home construction. And I have charts to show you this. So is this what's happening? Is there a fear of stagflation in the market right now? Let's look at the tips first. Now, going back to 2020 into 2021, tips were outperforming the longer term maturity bonds because there was a fear that inflation was going to be rising, that the Fed was going to step in and start raising interest rates. But then as we got through 2022 into 2023, look what happened here. The inflation worries or expectations started to subside. Now we're not headed straight down, but you can see both with the moving average that I have on this chart and these other lines that are kind of like trend lines showing how the inflation worries have been subsiding, meaning that the three to seven year bond is now starting to outperform the inflation adjusted bonds. So there's not a lot of fear of stagflation. Let's go a little further out where we take the tips and we compare to them to the seven to 10 year bonds. Well, as we were having problems in 2020 into 2021, as they were putting all this liquidity into the market and cutting rates to zero, there were some real inflation worries but it's starting to come down a little bit. It's starting to subside a little bit. So when we look back at this chart, we're looking at the three to seven year bond ETF. We go a little further out, we look at the seven to 10 year bond ETF. Both of them are starting to come back down. They're not going up the way they were previously. What about home construction? That's a very interest rate sensitive area. If it costs more to build houses, if it costs more for mortgages, don't you think that hurts the housing market? Of course it does. But look what's happening with this ratio. When we compare the home construction ETF to the three to seven year treasury bond, home construction is actually going up and it's getting ready to go back and exceed this previous high. If the economy was getting ready to fall off a cliff interest rate wise, these are smart people that are trading these things. Do you think they would be going up the way they are right now? No, this could always change but we can only go with what we see right now, and this is showing a lot of improvement. If there was substantial inflation concerns, we would not see the home construction ETF outperforming the three to seven year bond ETF, but that's what we are seeing here. 
We can look to the QQQ. We can look to the Eurozone. We can look to home construction. We can look at some other areas that seem to be showing some improvement, but we're not seeing that improvement yet in the S&P 500. So this is what we'll be watching in addition to all the other things that I also watch and report on in the videos. Another area to look at, growth in value stocks. Now, this is something that I deal with on a daily basis, but I also really address this in the intermarket analysis video that I put out each weekend. There are basically two broad categories for stocks. You have growth stocks and value stocks. Growth stocks offer substantially higher or faster growth rates as opposed to the mean or average growth rate that's prevailing in the market at any given time. And they also generate more earnings rapidly. The idea with growth stocks, as I said earlier, is to buy low and sell high. That's why people get into Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and companies like that. They want to buy low and sell high. These are considered longer term because when you buy that stock, you're projecting out into the future what you hope their earnings will be. Now, we compare that with value stocks. They have the potential of selling at a higher price. They go up and down just like other stocks. And in fact, in 2022, they were down also, but they were down less than growth stocks. And that's mainly what we were watching. But due to the company's adverse condition in the market, meaning the market's going down, the stock is trading at a lower price than it's actually worth. They still have pretty solid earnings. They may pay dividends. They may have steady sales. They may even grow their sales at some point. A lot of times these are more established companies that have been around a while, and so people consider them safer. And we look at the value stocks as being more short-term, where the growth stocks are more long-term. And that's what I say here in this next part. Because they do pay their dividends and they typically have slower growth, these are the boring companies that have been around forever that you probably have heard of. And they're not really all that sexy, but people still like to invest in them anyway. As a general rule, during bull markets, meaning when we're going up in a solid upward trend, investors favor growth stocks. When we're in a bear market, which means we're going down, investors favor value stocks. And that's what we saw played out throughout 2022. So here's a look at growth versus value. This is similar to some of the charts that I show in each week's video where from 2022, growth was really underperforming value. But look at what's happening since the beginning of 2023. Are we seeing some improvement here? We're above all of these moving averages in the rainbow, so this could be looking a little bit better. Just to give us another look, let's compare value with growth, just doing the opposite. Or value had really been outperforming in 2022, and now it's starting to show some weakness, and it's breaking below the moving averages in our moving average rainbow. That's a potential feather in the cap for the bullish side of things. This is what the market is anticipating. So our conclusion, the debate continues to go back and forth. And no matter what podcast you listen to, no matter what financial media station you tune into, no matter what blog post you read, everybody has an opinion. I like to look at charts. There's a real debate. Are interest rates going to go up, down, what have you? We talk about that every day. What about earnings growth? That's been going down lately. Is it going to start to show some improvement? Fed policy. What's the Fed going to do at their next meeting? And then recession fears. Are we going to go into a recession? Are we going to have a hard landing? Are we going to have a soft landing? The list goes on and on and on. There's always things to debate in the market. That's what makes it so interesting and personally why I find it so fascinating. While the conclusion concerning interest rates is far from certain at the time I record this video, we do have a lot of reference points that we can watch, and I'm adding more all the time. I'm constantly doing research and finding new charts and new ways to look at things, and that's why I decided to do this extra video. Please watch the daily videos. I'll be updating everything that I'm talking about here on an as-needed basis. So please watch the videos each day. The information that I presented here as it changes, as it's telling us something, I will be addressing that in the daily videos. What about updates? The charts that are used in this video are updated, viewed, and analyzed daily. I have listed charts. I have close to 400 charts that I look at every day. I go through all of them. I look at them and I say, this is telling us something. This is not telling us anything right now. So I skip that one. I try to keep the videos anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes each day. I know that's a considerable amount of time, but if you really want to understand what's going on under the hood of the market, 
I feel it's imperative to analyze these things day in and day out. As necessary, updates will be made in the daily video updates, as I just said before. Please feel free to view these daily video updates. They're free of charge on YouTube. I post them. Eventually, they'll be locked down, but for right now, they're freely available. I wake up early in the morning and I prepare them. It takes me about six to eight hours to prepare each video. And actually, that's going to be changing here pretty quick. But I post them just as soon as all the information comes in. I can record the video, edit it, and then upload it, as well as other videos that I have. Because 2022, going into 2023, has been a very challenging time for the stock market. I've been doing this since the early 90s. And this has been one of the most challenging environments that I can recall. But for most people that want to buy low and sell high, this has been just a nightmare for folks wondering when are we going to get to the other side of this whole thing. So the goal, my goal is to post additional videos above and beyond just the daily videos that I do and then the three different weekly videos that I prepare. I have an entire list of topics that I want to cover in addition to my daily and weekly videos but I've not had the time or energy to produce them. As I said before, it takes me six to eight hours just to do each day's video. Over the weekend, I don't even know how many hours that takes. So what I've been able to do is find some automation that reduces some of the time that I have to spend preparing the video. As I have more free time, my hope is to post numerous additional supplemental videos on a lot of different topics that are considered relevant at the time. What are some of these additional topics? Let me know if you have a desired topic that you would like to have covered. However, here's the gotcha. My main focus is on those market forces that impact the S&P 500. I don't want to stray too far from that topic. I don't get into individual stocks. Hey, can you bring up this chart of ABC company and tell me what you think of it? No, I don't do that. I look at the index itself and all the information that comes from that. I also don't deal with penny stocks. I look at the crypto market, but I just find it fascinating. I'm not involved in it or the Forex market. That's the way I feel about it. Some of you are going to stop the video right now and click a dislike and go on to the next one. That is fine by me. I have found that the S&P does more than we'll ever want it to do for creating the kind of wealth that if you're willing to dig in and learn and discipline yourself, you'll be able to set all of your goals just by focusing on the S&P 500. But that's the conclusion I've reached. You need to try to reach that conclusion yourself. Nor do I want to become too academic. I don't want to get into the different schools of economic thought. I don't want to go back and forth about... What is this going to happen? What about that? Where we're talking about all this stuff that really doesn't matter. I want to stay away from that. My desire is to present information in a way that's actionable. You can actually take what I'm talking about and you can apply it to the current condition of the S&P 500. That's what I'm trying to do here. For example, just to give you an idea, a couple of videos that I really want to produce in the very near future cover hedging. Did you know that nobody should ever lose money in the stock market? Most people don't know that. But you can hedge. And it's not some secret conspiracy that's being kept from you. It's that most people don't know that you can do this. It's like buying insurance. I'm going to do a video about that. I also teach that in my classes. I'm also going to do a deeper video where I explain the case to suggest that, yes, we will go into a recession. There's a lot of evidence for that. There's also a strong case to be made that, no, we're not going to go into a recession. And I want to present both of those sides, try to reach a conclusion, let you watch it, let you decide, but now arm you with more analysis and information so that you can make better decisions. These are just a couple of ideas. I've got a whole list of additional topics. So thank you very much. I really hope you found this helpful. I enjoyed putting this together and being able to present it to you. I apologize for any background noise. I also apologize for the audio. I'm not in the current place where I usually do record videos. I'm just using the built-in microphone here on a laptop. But please let me know what you think of this. Please feel free to check out the daily and weekly videos that I post. I would like to get to know you, and I really hope that you found this useful. So have a great day, and I will talk to you in the next video.